pain as the masses below strike a terror in their eyes. Running back through the mid morning strike, there's a burning in our hearts. As we banish capitalists from the workers' lands to a place in Central Park. On your left is Dream Z to believe our destiny is now. It's Friday night, and you know what that means? It means another Shabbat stream with Trekkie69 and special guest Twin Rabbits. Hello, 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 come to the rads. How are we doing? I hope y'all are doing well. Anyways, um, we are here uh, just uh, waiting up for Twin to the Rabbits. Um, and hey, what's up, comrade? Hello, hello. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing well. Um, I just realized I have enough room on my desk to put my computer as my, uh, or my laptop as my second screen, which is Bueno. Anyways, how you been? I've been pretty good, actually. I've uh, been answering emails for one of the nonprofits that I work with. So sending out invites to various meetings and such. Totally valid. Uh, anyways, why don't you, uh, first off, uh, Shabbat Shalom, and um, second off, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, hello, uh, I go by Twin Rabbit. Also, Tale of Two Rabbit and uh, Rabbit Thoughts on Twitter. So. Consistency is the hobgoblin of having an internet presence, but I do mostly indigenous history and indigenous cultural work here on Twitch as well as on YouTube. And um, on Twitter, I'm mostly shitpost. Hey, ain't nothing wrong with shitposting. Or nothing inherently wrong with shitposting, I guess I should say. All right, sorry, I am just setting up uh, this second screen arena. Because um, I realized I didn't do that, you know, I was prepared with everything else, but um, apparently I wasn't prepared for that uh, in terms of the stream, so. Uh, Yay! What about you? How's your week been going? <laughs> My week's been pretty well. Uh, it's been going pretty well, um, nothing necessarily to complain about, um, I'm actually very happy because, um, I, uh, I recently, um, figured a consist uh, out a consistent way to apply spirit gum to my lace wig, so I'm really liking how that turned out. Very cool. Yeah, you know, especially as disabled people, it's, you know, it's the small things that, you know, always get you excited, and it's actually a new one, her name is Maya. I'd say, okay, it did look new. All right, I like the I like the curl up in the back. It's very nineteen twenties, thirties ish. It's actually uh, mainly a nineteen sixties style. At least in fifties, uh, sixties, the front was big, but the French twist is uh, always a classic. Yeah. Um. Anyways, uh, another thing, uh, Shabbat is a thing um we eat stuff um i don't know if uh, you have anything to eat uh tr uh but i do and in order to do that um i like doing prayers beforehand because it's ritual and you know fun tradition that i've rewritten the prayers for um once i'm done uh the response is solidarity uh yeah Anyways, um, this is over the candles, or in my case, one candle. Solidarity with you, fellow proletarians, whose efforts allow us to light these beautiful candles. May the light of these candles show the way towards a better world. There we go. Um... Oh, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if y'all can see it, but 
it's it's there. <laughs> yeah, true ATS. Um, it is uh, it is indeed Twin Rabbits, the the guest of the stream. Um, anyways, is over the drink, which I have um, a tiny uh, shot glass kiddish cup. Um, <laughs> That's very cute. I like that. Uh, my parents were like, uh, so you have a really fancy Venetian glass one? But, like, we don't want, you know, you to bring that to an on-campus apartment. And I'm like, I mean, that's totally fair. And so they gave me a tiny <laughs> little uh, shot glass kiddish cup. And I'm like, okay, I mean, <laughs> I'm taking a shot of uh, peach iced tea flavored crystal, uh, crystal light pure, but uh, okay. Perfect. Yeah. Anyways, solidarity with you, fellow proletarians, whose efforts allow us to enjoy these drinks. One day, all shall be able to quench their thirst, and no one shall, no one will go without drink. Solidarity. Indubitably. Um, this is over the food. Uh, so today, um, I, uh, not many people, um, uh, it's debated as to whether rice is kosher for Passover or not, and I'm like, as long as it's not, you know, leavened wheat, products i'm fine with it so uh i got uh white rice um mixed with uh some korean beef uh from a local uh asian restaurant um nice. anyways yeah it's very yummy solidarity with you fellow proletarians whose efforts allow us to enjoy this food one day all will enjoy plentiful food and none shall go hungry solidarity Cup all the way. I'm not familiar with uh, with that practice, uh, Bry. Um, okay. Um, oh, and I also got ice cream. Um, but no cookies and cream as usual, because that has leavened wheat products in it. And until tomorrow evening, it's Pesach, and that's uh, custom is to not eat... Um, I mean, uh, most Jews are way more broad, but I'm just like, no, as long as it's not, you know, leavened wheat products, I'm, I'm fine with it. Um, anyways, this is for hand washing, um, and since I'm not near a sink, uh, and I remembered this time, I got, uh, I got the, the spray bottle I have in my backpack. <laughs> uh, solidarity with you, fellow proletarians, whose hands are dirty with commodity production. One day you shall be free from wage slavery. I mean, I really should say we, but... Solidarity. Yeah. Anyways, um, do you have a poem or song for us? And um, then we can get on to the topic of discussion that you brought for us. I do. Awesome. Uh, there's a Cherigi or Chalagi poet named Quoli Driscoll. Uh, Quoli is... I believe non-binary and has written several collections of poems over the years. Uh, this one is from Walking with Ghosts and the title is Book of Memory. Very cool. What, pr what prayers will save us? Here at the genesis of a terrified century, there is work to do. We construct words from shrapnel and despair, fasten them with images of the missing, sculpt anguish into seismic rebellion. We shudder under the weight of loss, fall to our knees before the rubble of our dead, look at the frantic geometries once named Bill, Tyra, Hattie Mae, Michelle, the jutting fractures we once named mother, lover, sister, son. What can I offer but these turbulent tears, my heart broken into infinite shapes of sorrow? Write it in a book of memory that as the powerful laugh at our earth-shattering loss, we, the merciful, gather like whirlwinds of fire embrace each other in mourning and rage wipe tears from each other's cheeks and whisper there is work to be done we fall before the voices left in hate's wake and open a book of memory to record improvisations of spirit revolutions of flesh our mutinous love here at the genesis of a dangerous millennium we intone names against fists and bullets here before the splintered destruction we gently open earth Gather the pieces left to quilt a new story, as our dead watch and wait, 
we become the prayers that save us. Mm. It's gorgeous. I love that so much. I thought it was appropriate. I agree. It's. I like the end, especially that it's hopeful. I liked that the, the thing, the two things that I really like about that poem is it's acknowledging that there was suffering, but that that suffering has led us down the path of reinvigorating ourselves. That we tell our stories specifically to make ourselves emboldened. Mm. It's also appropriate that that message is, um, uh, has been made during Pesach because for those of um, you know, in the audience who saw my Seder streams, you'll know especially that it's a tradition to tell the story of Pesach in order to, you know, remind us that, you know, we have struggled and that, you know, not everyone in the world is free and that, you know, we got to do something about it. But, you know, it's also a formative experience. Yeah, I was wondering if you were going to do the uh, why is this night different than other nights? Mm. <laughs> I try to do at least a little bit of homework. Um, yeah, I mean, that's more traditional. I thought it was um, f um, more interesting um, f uh, to take it from the Bund Haggadah, uh, specifically because, you know, it was essentially saying, uh, why are the proletariat fucked over while the bourgeoisie, you know get to live high on uh, on the hog, so to speak. Does that one require the leaning back like kings? Um, Pesa, um it, it, traditionally, yeah, but what's interesting is that I've actually never been to a Seder where people purposefully lay back. Like, it's an option, but I personally don't find eating very, uh, very... Unless, you know, I'm, um, I'm, um... I mean, you know, like a, a hedonism bot from friggin' Futurama and being fed grapes, <laughs> I, I find uh, when I'm feeding myself, it's easier not to recline. I've tried eating while leaning on one elbow in, in the style of Romans and Egyptians of the period, and I don't find it even remotely comfortable. I would I would find it hard to maintain that position for very long while trying to relax. Mm. <laughs> Who knows? It might have been like a flex. Oh, that's possible. Well, and I like what Bri the guy is bringing up, uh, connecting you with a history because that's a privilege not everyone has. One of the reasons that the poem alludes to their names were Ella, their names were Bryson, their names were... Because in some cases we have to build a new past because we don't have the stories from the ancients. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah, it's... Ross Seuss told me that there, that, that, uh, that there are many indigenous languages that no one can translate because only the fucking British Museum has them, you know, locked behind, uh, uh, behind information and closure to use, uh, to use the terminology Sylvia Federici has been teaching me in Caliban and the Witch. Oh, that's a good one. There is one Caribbean language that the only surviving records that we have of it was a parrot that was kept by a settler, well, a conqueror, actually. But the parrot had been around the indigenous population for a long enough time that it had learned a few phrases in the native language. And so at some point, a naturalist realized that it wasn't speaking Spanish or English, but it was actually speaking one of the native languages. And so it wrote, he wrote down everything the parrot said. Wow. And that's the only information we have. I mean, I didn't know this, but um, 
It's interesting how Sylvia Federici actually weaves in uh, colonization into her work in Caban and the Witch. I didn't know this, but uh, she, um, she quotes an estimate that 95% of the indigenous population was wiped out uh, 100 years after uh, colonization in South, a in South America, which wouldn't surprise me. I mean, just the utter yeah. butchery of it. The only trouble that I have with that stat is the uncontacted tribe in the, Am the uncontacted tribes they have in the Amazon still currently. So oh, the number is, well, the number is more reliably a reflection of the way that the indigenous groups that we knew about at the time were treated. And so I still think it's a valuable, it's a valuable talking point. I just, I don't know that the number is quite accurate, but mm -hmm. I mean, we're really splitting hairs at that point because mm -hmm. They're, the colonizers were genocidal, so. Mm -hmm. I am very happy how she brings race and class into her analysis, which I was kind of worried she wouldn't, but she has a whole section on the changing relationship of slave women. How, far, how far are you in? Um, I think like half. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm reading it because uh, next Sunday, uh, Grace of uh, Feminist Critique and I are going to be doing a, a a stream on it. Oh, very cool. Mm hmm My unleavened bread is a uh, corn tortilla, in case anyone's <laughs> curious. Very cool. Anyways, um, what topic did you bring for us uh, after my selfish digression? <laughs> Oh, quite all right. Uh, it actually connects. The topic that I was interested in discussing is specifically because things like the question is asked by the youngest person at the table. This is meant to be a gathering. I'm curious how other people define the concept of family, because I know a lot of people look at their blood relatives and say, well, a lot of them are really conservative or a lot of them are really homophobic. And so we end up getting alienated from that part of family. But in the lefty sphere, I think sometimes we sort of forget that we still need a sense of community. Like, I jokingly say that the first international was frat boys playing mean girls. I mean, that's... <laughs> not far off from what I, from the secondary sources I've read. Well, to me, it almost rings of family infighting. They're trying to build their own community because they don't have one already. I mean, we all have that one uncle and you put up <laughs> with him because you're related. <laughs> so it I mean, was to I, me. I found out, hmm? um, I actually found out last week that, um, that I didn't remember this because my childhood memory is horrible, but my second cousin's family has a giant portrait of Lenin hanging in their house to this day. Oh, really? And, um, yeah. Uh, uh, I, it, I really need to get, uh, um, um, both, um, my second cousin and, uh, and, uh second cousins and, uh, and both of their, uh, both of their parents on for Shabbat stream. Just because I know during the Reagan administration, um, uh, they lived in Italy, and so I'm probably going to be asking them if they had any contact with the PCI, and if so, what was it like? Oh, that would be really interesting. Yeah, apparently, uh, um, I'm assuming my parents must have uh, must have uh, uh, introduced them to my Twitch stream because uh, my cousin Simon showed it um, to his... Uh, to his parents, and they apparently really liked it, so, um... Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, I thought it was all, I, I, I thought I was, uh, alone, uh, in keeping the, in keeping the spirit of, uh, lefty Judaism alive in my family. Because if you were an Ashken an Eastern European Ashkenazi Jewish immigrant in the United States, roughly between 1880... In 1960, you either were a socialist yourself or half your family, not including you, was. <laughs> Unfortunately, it died out partially as a generational thing and partially as a the generations became white thing. Right. 
Mm. Well, in the the poem that I read, it as I was reading it the first time, because it was one of them that I'd thought of, and as I was reading through it, and it was talking about how we create these ideas of family, you know, the things that started going through my head were, for example, the sort of house system that happens in gay ballroom dance and the I know a lot of lefty communities that they will refer to like elders in the community and what they're talking about is someone who's you know late 30s early 40s so this idea that we've sort of built our own community out of like-minded individuals I wonder how that's going to get transmitted into because you know the you know the ideal is Post-revolution, a lot of these problems will be dealt with. Things like economic inequality, things like exploitation. But I don't see a lot of people talking about, but how will we support one another in a community sense? Mm. Well, I mean, unlike a lot of socialists, especially in the 19th century, I do think we need to abolish the nuclear family because Hillary Clinton got one thing right in her life. Takes a village to raise a child. Oh yeah, I definitely think the nuclear family is a, a problem because virtually no major historic communities have gone by that definition. The idea that you, especially if you're in the native world, here in the US, but also in other areas, everybody is your auntie or your uncle the idea that you would be restricted to simply the person who is your direct blood parents is almost absurd. <laughs> so <laughs> extended family is, is sort of a non sequitur. The, what do you mean extended? They're all my family. Yeah, and it's interesting because Jews historically have had a very strong sense of community simply because, you know, we were either explicitly or implicitly forced to be in small segregated communities and so that's developed through a very communal culture um unfortunately you know it, it, i think sometimes it's gone a bit too far with the whole you can only marry i know of a lot of jewish parents who will like disown their children if they marry outside of the outside of the the uh, the faith quote unquote How lax are they willing to be on that definition, though? Like, if it's if it's an Ashkenazi and they don't really go to temple very much, but you know, what what have you noticed that there's a consistent cutoff point? Um, depends upon the family. Okay. Uh, Kibitzin tried to abolish a family forcibly in their parents. Um, well, the thing is, Bry, um. By a, the thing is, is that while I can say and give a lot of um, a lot of prescriptions on what I think a future society should look like, um, uh, in a very real sense, it all does depend upon the in individual material conditions. I don't th it personally, as an anarchist and someone who is very big on um prefigurative politics i think we should just go back to and take uh take um take inspiration from the more communal cultures out there especially indigenous ones and i mean i uh it, you know for me mo uh, i'm noticing more and more that i'm trying to you know decolonize myself the more and more i'm getting an affinity of you know the radical parts of jewish culture uh, ashkenazi jewish culture um, and how there is this sense of community, not just among Jews, but among everyone. Um, for me, Elijah's and Miriam's cups, uh, on Pesach represent, uh, represent the idea that a table is always open for anyone who's hungry and wants to eat. And I really like that idea. Um... that there's a similar concept in a lot of indigenous practice um, frequently will will set out what's called a spirit plate, which is ultimately an acknowledgement of 
that which is outside of our immediate home. So the spirit plate will usually be placed outside the back door or uh, somewhere away from the main table where most people are eating. And that's implicitly stating there are other members of our family who aren't here right now. Mm. I think rituals like that are very important. Like, speaking of family and community making, um, historians especially, I think, have done a good job of, in, of demonstrating how community building is very much based off of ritual, both literal and figurative, and kind of reinforcing those messages. We were talking about earlier, you know, I mean, what is oral history other than a form of ritual, uh, ritualized communal memory uh, recitation and, and identity? Oh, agreed. Well, and, and Bri, I, I like the way that you're phrasing the question. I, but personally, when I talk about things like abolishing the nuclear family, because I will occasionally say that, but what I'm referring to is getting rid of that as a necessity. In other words, the expectation that either you're a child who was raised by a mother and a father, white picket fence and two dogs, or you're somehow broken. And I find great fault with that. I would much rather see that as not being a standard at all. Mm. I mean, I see the abolition of the family as um, as part and parcel with destroying um, destroying the patriarchy as um, as well. Um, especially, uh, oh, sorry, I have something in my teeth. <laughs> I don't know. There we go. Teeth, I have saved you. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's more of um, you know what Twin, Twin Rabbit said. It's more of changing culture and cultural values. It's not you know about forcing anyone. I mean, there's going to be a, a, enough force during the revolution as it is. You know, it's going to be more in the reconstruction of society. And people also forget in the United States, especially, but anywhere you can't dismiss half the population um that is of you know non-males um and especially cis women if we're talking about population wise you know i'm not i mean hopefully that the percentage of you know trans women will increase as you know queerness becomes more and more accepted but my point is, is that in the United States, uh, everywhere, but in the United States, um, dismantling things like systemic racism and uh, as much as possible and, you know, uh, cis-heteronormativity and, you know, patriarchy, it's the only way we can have a successful socialist revolution is if those artificial barriers in the proletariat are overcome as best as possible. And, um, the, um... Oh, it was, I think it was the Red Guards who were like the Asian Black Panthers in San Francisco who uh, were inspired by Mao's feminist views to uh, create a, uh, a communal uh, child care program so, you know, women could participate in party activities. And that, that, that's kind of what I want through voluntary, you know, culture shift as much as possible. Because it's those things that ultimately will lead to a successful revolution. And so for me, revolutions take... The preparation of the revolution is decades longer than the actual revolution. And then revolutions truly aren't complete until a generation after. Simply because, you know, the most of the people who weren't raised in this new society are going to be, you know, held back in some way or another. It's... It, it's... It's complicated and it's inevitably going to be messy. Um, but I see violence more in terms of liberate, liberatory violence 
and protective violence from, you know, reactionaries. Um, it's, that's mostly what it's going to be. And the only reason why I'm not an anarcho-pacifist actually is because I do believe that unfortunately violence is going to be a, unfor well, overt physical violence is going to be a, a necessity of self-defense. Anyways, family. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think this is all a factor. Although, Lynn, that is a good question. How much of this guy do non-binary people hold? I think once we start to etch away at the idea that your family is limited to this male-female binary, that non-binary people in, in specific are going to be considered more an element than they can be right now. Exactly, and we should... I mean, obviously, I think it's important, you know, to know the people who gave birth to you and, you know, the people who, gave, uh, who you know, gave birth to others. I think it's just important, you know, if nothing else, for medical reasons, but... Um, I do like the idea of, you know, stretching the definition of family to your local community as a home and in, as a whole and in a more abstract way, you know, all of humanity, um, eventually. I think, um, that's actually what a lot of, um, what a lot of early, um, socialist feminists in the United States did. Um, they, uh, they kind of took a, uh, it was, it was progressive and regressive in that, they bought into, you know, the mother's role as the caregiver, but, you know, the caregivers of society is one big family, which is like, right. w w which is like, you know, you're so close, but, <laughs> but it's not just, you know, the woman's special role. It's anyone who wants it. And, you know, if women don't want to be caregivers and, you know, uh, they, they, they want to smash the fash, uh, that should be fine too. <laughs> well, and honestly, uh, like in my own situation, I have several male family members who are incredibly nurturing and quite good with children and several female family members who don't really like children all that much. I mean, they, they like their own children, but they're not fond of children in general. And I have no problem with one of the uncles taking the kids and going off and playing or whatever. And yet they will still try to sort of reinforce this expectation that mom should be the one in control of the daycare. And I'm like, y you're so close on this. <laughs> you exactly. have a nurturing father who is perfectly willing to emotionally engage with the kids. Mom finds them annoying. And yet you don't want to just acknowledge that that's happening. Exactly. Also, I think in a lot of ways, um... Uh, it, this is probably going to be a very contentious uh, thing with a lot of uh, with a lot of Jews out there. But I think the idea of you know ethnicity and culture being a descent of only one parent, and in Judaism's case specifically the mother. I mean, what happens if you know two of your the two of your parents are non-binary? You know, and the also what happens if um. If, uh, if, say, you have a trans man and a cis man in a gay, in a, in a, uh, in a gay relationship, and the dude gives birth, um, who, uh, um, it, it brings up all these questions, and that's why I'm like, you know, if you can trace Judaism to somewhere in your family, and you want to identify as Jewish and, you know, really connect with your culture, um, that's good. What's really interesting for me is in my relationship with, uh, to Judaism is that I'm very religious in certain ways and that I'm trying to get more and more into practice with, you know, celebrating holidays. And yet I'm an atheist, but I think that's <laughs> unique to Judaism in that we have multiple ethnicities and cultures that are associated with the religion. Well, I... I certainly am not well versed in the topic, but as I understand the Talmudic practice overall, 
the fact that you want to debate these topics is perfectly welcome in the tradition, if, if I'm clear that the, the idea that uh, you're starting an argument based on these premises is, is not on its face unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Also, if I ever have kids, I only would want to adopt. Um, like, I, I don't feel the need to, you know, have biological kids. Like, I would adopt simply because uh, there are, you know, so many, uh, so many orphans out there. I specifically probably would want to adopt, um, uh, chill, um, specifically, oh, I'm not gonna, it, I'm not going, uh, to this on stream because it can be taken the wrong way. Uh, anyways, thank you for the follow. Um, but yeah, um, like, I do like the idea of, you know, having your biological parents and then having, you know, your other non-biological parents. The, the idea of parent as a protector and a caregiver less than, you know, literally, you know, I, I, uh, I can, we conceived you and gave birth to you. There's a, a pretty strong tradition of adoption in both my and my partner's ancestry, not like direct lineage, but our cultural traditions. And more importantly, he and I have discussed this and we've both agreed that we want to adopt and specifically what we want to adopt is indigenous kids who have been alienated from their community because that's actually a really common event that takes place. And that's certainly not going to say that, you know, we're limiting ourselves or that, oh God, <laughs> I know so many, apologies for that, but I know oh, so I many. Oh, I don't care. Okay. As long as as long as it's not the uh, a slur, say whatever the fuck you want, and uh, well, well, a slur or um, ableist language, uh, simply because I filter out a lot of that in my chat. Words like i d i o t d u m b etc. Right. But um, no, say fuck or shit or god, you know, all you want. <laughs> okay, I, I will keep that in mind. Um, the only the only reason that that stuck for me for a moment was I know gay couples with a fairly substantial income who have ultimately adopted what I would best describe as designer babies. You know, they'll decide I'm going to get an ethnic baby and they will say it in those terms. And I find that incredibly alienating. So as I say, my partner and I have worked this out. We've discussed it at length and one of the things that we're very clear on is that it's not that we're going to be overly selective, but that's where our first intent is going to be, is trying to reintegrate an indigenous child who has been alienated from their community, rather than say, you know, walk in and immediately choose the two-year-old, blonde-haired, blue-eyed child. <laughs> it's like, okay, you know, I know there's a sales pitch involved, but could we not? <laughs> Yeah, my, um, my plan for, uh, I personally would want to, you know, adopt, uh, someone as young as possible, um, sim um, but, uh, how do you non-creepily pick a child to adopt? That's, and that's sort of where one gets caught is is how do you phrase this statement in such a way that it doesn't sound like you're being an abjectly terrible human being <laughs> so you know i try to argue it instead from the other side and say that what we're trying to do is reincorporate these kids who have been intentionally separated from their community mm. bry here with all of the different traditions that would readily acknowledge you. I like yeah, this. Yeah, I, I did see that. No, yeah, I remember coming across the practices of humanistic Judaism, which I probably should look into more. Um, but honestly, what I really want to do more than anything is read uh, is read the Torah, the Talmud, and the Tanakh. Um, not in their original Hebrew, because, I mean, when... It, at this point, uh, learning Yiddish has been relegated to my bucket list. 
I can understand. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just too honest with myself to say, oh, you know, I'm gonna learn Yiddish one of these days, and I'm like, no, I want to learn Yiddish before I die. Um, <laughs> and as I'm 28 now, uh, that gives me over half a century to do so. Um, uh, assuming uh, um, any vestige of uh, of internet survives that long. Well, plus, you know, on top of that, learning the little bit of Aramaic and ecumenical Hebrew on top. I mean, that's that's a tall order. <laughs> that's a lot to learn. I would recommend setting up a uh, savings account right, I don't know, now, <laughs> so that you have about a year that you can just dedicate. Oh, oh, uh, what savings? Student debt is a thing. Uh, $40,000 so far. So, um... Savings account? <laughs> Savings account. <laughs> oh, I am an upper. I am. I am. Uh, I am. You know, uh, a child of fairly well. Uh, my mom is a literal petty bourgeoisie. That's 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 where that's where my income bracket is. My mom is literal <laughs> petty bourgeoisie. It's where I am, you know, just below uh, the, the the capitalist class, and I'm just like, and I'm just thinking, you know, th there were white collar socialists, a lot of them. Yeah. Like, it's almost as if white-collar workers are still workers or something. <laughs> and definitely not part of the ruling class. Yeah, as long as you don't have hiring or firing power, um, I hate to, it, I, I hate to break it to you, but, uh, your economic, uh, and ultimately societal interests are more in common with the blue-collar workers. That's why, um, oh, just very random tangent. Uh, I hate the term middle class, especially because historians use it so fucking often. And I'm like, okay, are we in 13th century Florence? No, we're in 2020. <laughs> Stop using the fucking term middle class. There is the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And then all five of the petty bourgeoisie in 2020 United States. This isn't fucking 1700 or 1800 when, you know, the small sole proprietor was, like, the vanguard of capitalism. Uh, so I'm using the fucking term middle class. Uh, you're, I think the term white collar and blue collar is much better when it, when it comes to describing the different roles that the middle class supposedly has over the working class. That's what I hate most about capitalism. We can feed everyone on Earth and have an excess of 20% of the population we can feed. Agreed. Mm-hmm. Speaking of families, this whole, uh, um, you know, the whole worry over, oh, the world's overpopulation. Fun fact, um, if you, uh, it... Fun fact, smaller population size is directly correlated with increases in bodily autonomy for women and non-men. Um, you know, uh, if, it, you know, population decline isn't a bad thing if literally just less people are being born instead of population decline of, hey, we're eco-fascists, let's just kill brown people. Um, <laughs> there is a distinction. I mean, yeah. Well, the thing is, is that if it's completely voluntary and you're having less kids because you're economically secure and capitalism isn't essentially saying we need more workers, pop out babies, um, then population size will naturally decline because, you know, people are having two kids instead of five. Personally, I'm a fan of smaller communities so i you know rather than that and getting into like ultimately there's eight billion people on earth which would fit in about lands land space wise would fit in half the country of belgium so you know we're not technically overpopulated anyway it's the exploitative mm. nature of the way that we currently gather exactly. in exceedingly large groups 
So, you know, personally, I would like to see smaller communities overall with more ability to interact between them. So, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to say that we should all move back to small towns because those are the uh, that's its own can of worms. <laughs> I uh -huh. have family in small town. These these people can be distinctly odd in, in very manipulative ways. Yeah. So that I don't necessarily advocate for that, but so you know, you're like me and not anti civ No, and more importantly, I like the idea of things like an interconnected communication network. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of cell phones. The internet's a perfectly valid thing. So you can be in a smaller physical space, space. and still have a lot of c outward contact. Exactly. And and, you know, you could, and in order to, you know, have those communal gathering spaces, you can have things like, you know, efficient and non-pollutant public transport. Oh, see, now there you go. Just go into the extremes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm an anarcho-transhumanist. Uh, uh, I, I can't help but believing that, especially for disabled people, uh, technology uh, can be liberating. And not in the genetic engineering sense. Uh, that should be only if you're in, uh, if you're in uh, uh, informed consent adult and say, you know, you don't want chronic pain and you go to, you know... The, the star base and go to the robot and say, hey, I don't want chronic pain anymore. And the robot's like, okay, ableism is eliminated and you are informally co consenting here. No more joint pain. Um, I, well, and to that end, I do like having the conversation, although it hasn't always been productive, but at least it gets it started, <laughs> I suppose. I do like having the conversation about things like accessibility and how it normalizes what people would normally treat as a disability. You know, it, the idea of having closed captions on your stream is no longer, if you say, I can't do closed caption because, you know, my browser won't support it or my computer has trouble with it, that's accepted. But if you just don't have captions, that is treated as a little odd in a way that it wouldn't have been treated even 10 years ago. Yeah. So we've now normalized people having hearing issues. We've normalized people or having... Or just people being autistic and sometimes having audio processing issues. Yeah, or, or basic sensory issues in general. So they prefer yeah. the muted streams. I fully support that. But Yeah, also... Um... I still don't know how to give closed captioning for my guests, which really annoys me. Oh, I can totally appreciate. Um, I, because of the amount of processing power that Chrome now uses, I have to go with Firefox. Otherwise, my computer just completely shits the bed. And <laughs> Firefox doesn't support the caption <clears throat> program. So I keep, I've been, I have been trying to find a third party captioner for probably three months now because the ones that are offered through twitch only activate using chrome with any reliability and i would much rather it be reliable and say i've closed mm -hmm. captioned or have it you know be just not there and tell people i'm sorry i don't have closed caption yeah. than for it to be once a month my captioning works exactly at this point i'm like i'd rather have captioning for myself at the very least so, you know, they're not completely left hanging. Right. It, I'm kind of like, it's better than nothing. Well, and that's why I keep trying to find a third party system that will do it that doesn't cost an arm and a leg. But for now, it's troubling that mm -hmm. the, the accessibility is still an issue. Regardless, I do find it incredibly hopeful that more people ask can you caption your videos than would have asked even a few years ago. It is pretty awesome. And I think that sense of family, sense of community is very helpful in creating empathy for other people and kind of cultivating that idea. That's why, that's why, you know, all of us, um, all of us socialists are so preoccupied with this idea of uh, of, you know, uh, 
stamping out individuality. Um, I it, I am personally, a, you know, I'm biased in this, but I think anarchism gets it right in our insistence that communities are groups of individuals, while groups of individuals are part of a community and society. And, um, you know, uh, to use uh, Mao, actually, um, um, uh, well, actually, no, he didn't see this contradiction. Uh, well, he did see it in a way. Um, I uh, just recently uh, read uh, The Little Red Book and some secondary literature on it, and it's fascinating, Mao's idea of contradiction, which I think is really interesting. Um, and there is that contradiction between, you know, individual and, uh, and collective. Um, it's, I, I don't know, you know, if we'll ever be able to resolve that contradiction, but I think it's interesting to try, and part of that is the idea of de-atomizing people into families. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, uh, public gatherings are, like, so formalized and so atomized now. Like, I feel as though autistic people would have a much easier time interacting with strangers if, if there wasn't this whole, you know, oh, a stranger danger, you know, oh, I don't know you, I've never talked to you before. Like, you know, obviously there's no complete fix for, you know, being socially awkward and being awkward around people you don't know. But I think a lot of that anxiety would be lessened if we lived in a society where you either knew everyone you interacted with regularly, or if you didn't, you lived in a culture that's, you know, accepting of, everyone today would be treated uh, or everyone in that society would be treated you know the way most people treat family that is you know decently yeah and there's also i mean there's some social traditions that factor into that that i find so very odd the, like specifically in the u.s but a couple of other sort of western european cultural expectations like eye contact and aggressive speech I find it odd specifically because in a lot of indigenous communities, eye contact is seen as aggressive. And so frequently people will be talking to you, but not at you. And that's not, that's not considered rude. It's just accepted. You don't necessarily maintain eye contact the entire time that you're talking to someone. And, you know, on the one hand you can say, so every native American was autistic, or you can say, <laughs> well, no, we just have a series of expectations that allows people who have this issue to feel more comfortable. I'm not saying that we have to go with everything that we do for, you know, universally, but in this particular instance, maybe the eye contact thing is a, an unnecessary expectation. Mm. That's interesting. Um, for me, I've found that, um, that due to our cultural idea of eye contact, when, I'm speaking to people online a lot of times if I'm not looking at the screen I naturally gravitate towards the webcam and you know like making eye contact um maybe I've just developed that because it, it, in our culture it's like a more intimate way um especially in our digital culture but yeah I think that's one of you know I I've said, you know, I never really masked throughout my life, but then I realized that I purposefully trained myself somehow subconsciously to look people in the eye because, you know, I was told, oh, you know, you need to look people in the eye. Uh, and, I, and I noticed that I did that at, in order to, you know, tell people, no, yes, I am listening to you. Um, mm -hmm. And I found that I, uh, that I nod a lot um, just to kind of... And it's interesting because, like, I a lot of times I'll nod because I like acknowledging, you know, that uh, people are being heard. But it's interesting how I've just developed those. And, you know, even though I, I have no longer been trying to mask, I actually kind of enjoy that because even though it's kind of a social ritual, it's a social ritual showing, no, yes, I, I hear what you're saying, you know? Yeah. Which it's, it can be equally as, I suppose, alienating or at least confusing, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, for people who 
are unaccustomed to that way of interacting when they're in a group of natives and almost no one is making eye contact. And yet if you tell a joke, the whole room laughs. <laughs> so they've been paying attention the whole time. Mm -hmm. They just weren't looking. <clears throat> but yeah, that's it. It's a pretty. That's me. Thing. I. I mean, that's me. I, I literally, you know, play video games while doing MA thesis research. And, you know, my parents have known for, for at least a decade now, uh, there we go, you know, back to, back to family, that I can play video games and just have a regular conversation. I mean, if anything, Twitch has shown that you can do that very easily. Oh, definitely. Let's plays while you're having a deeply philosophical conversation about Sterner. It's, it, it has, I think, broadened a lot of people's access to those sorts of conversations. Yeah. They wouldn't have been able to do it in person previously. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm also going to be getting a note from my psychiatrist, because yay, having to prove your disability, um, in order to get accommodations for when classes return in person to be able to play video games in class. Because that's why I've been loving virtual class so much is because I've been able to play video games and ask any of my professors and you'll know I am one of the most active participants. Well, and okay, to... And I'm playing video it. games while doing it. To review the one point that Wing asked, I have genuinely oh. no idea why it is that those captions only work on Chrome. My presumption is that it has something to do with Google nonsense. I don't know, but... I, for whatever reason, they don't work on Firefox. And they'll even tell you that. If you download the extensions, they will tell you specifically, unless you're lose, using Google Chrome, this won't work. Or it won't work reliably. Which to me is even odder because it also doesn't work on um, Microsoft. So I, I don't know why, huh? but okay. Yeah, the Microsoft, if you use uh, Edge, whatever the new one is, it's also inconsistent, so figure that one out, but... Yeah, Google Chrome is the only one that has the extensions for uh, pronouns. Mm-hmm. So, um... Damn, I need to remember to use Chrome then on my second screen. And also, I can't use it in my Streamlabs OBS, um, even though I cover that up and use the second screen because I've found that not knowing how many viewers I have makes me a lot less anxious. I can understand that. Like, I can't tell you how much better I feel when I don't know how many viewers I have because there isn't that anxiety. I like what, w I like what Wing is putting out here. Oh, that's why people th think I'm not listening. Yes, mm. uh, I don't know if this is helping you, but... Indeed, the eye contact issue is a huge deal. Um, if you've ever heard of, there's a sort of life comedian whose name is David Sedaris. Oh, I'm from, he, he's an author, I think. Yes, yes. And he does, you know, book presentations, talks about his life. Uh, he's a very odd man just in general, so his life stories tend to be pretty interesting. But he has a brother who was diagnosed with Asperger's and... Uh, the family never really thought anything of it. They just knew that their this one son used phrases in a very odd way, and he tended to not make a lot of eye contact, and he would trail off while he was talking and start walking off into another room because he just sort of assumed people were going to follow <laughs> him while he was talking. Fucking Chad. Right? And uh, he always dressed in clothes that felt comfortable, which means he frequently looked like he had no idea how to dress. Uh, but anyway, he wrote a book that was titled Look Me in the Eye. And it's him talking about the experience of growing, you know, going to grade school and going to high school and how incredibly alienated he was from so many of his instructors from counselors, from this, this whole swath of people who were supposed to be his support because he didn't have this normal interaction method that everybody else seemed to find so natural and intrinsic. You know, he couldn't read- It's only normal because well. our culture tells us it is. Yeah, and that, well, and the thing that he found most alienating was he doesn't really understand sarcasm. And he said that because sarcasm is mm. largely a matter of body language and tone which for him were completely impenetrable. Oh, so, I'm pretty bad with body language still. 
Wait, why did my camera go off? I must have pressed a button. Okay, camera, mm -hmm. come back. Okay, good, camera's back. But yeah, body language is... I mean, like, I can tell when people are smiling and, you know, like, frowning or crying, but, like, subtle things I'm very bad at. And also I'm very... Uh, I'm not the best at, like, con uh, conversational cues either. Right. Which is weird, because I love sarcasm and irony, and I'm very good at picking it up. But then again, they're also very different contexts. Like, that's very much humor, and it's also the way, I, uh, way I'm trained to think. Oh, I like what Lynn is saying. My way of understanding sarcasm is knowing what the other person believes. And Oh, that uh oh, that's actually very helpful too. Oh, well, and you know, I have friends who have various gradations on the spectrum, and a few of them when they were introduced to me, so the other person would say, "Oh, by the way, he's autistic. He won't understand you." Because I I tend to be in person a very sarcastic person, and my immediate response every time is no it's okay <laughs> if they want to ask me what i just said or whether i was serious i'm okay with that me because too. well what i've learned is and I, I don't know why this is personally i have some ideas about it but one of the things that uh, you know will say quote unquote normal but what they mean is average average people when they're talking aren't used to having a question asked following a joke or following a statement or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so they find that alienating or off-putting. And so they think that they have to explain to me, <laughs> oh, he's going to ask you a lot of questions. Um, and that is, uh, I, I'm used to that. So Yeah, like, I don't really care. Um, it's been, like, a dear friend and fellow streamer, uh, Tumble Dryer Maya, um, who I actually named this wig, uh, uh, Maya in her honor, because it's a cool wig and it came from Scotland and Maya's from Scotland, so. Um, <laughs> uh, she's, uh, also, uh, has ASD like me. Um, uh, it, we're so like in so many ways. Uh, she's like my younger sister, honestly. Uh, well, uh, it, in terms of the extended family metaphor, um, we're both neurodiverse. Uh, we both have, uh, um, need, uh, corrective, uh, eye implements. Um, she wears glasses. I mostly wear contacts. Um, we're both Jewish. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, and we're both, uh, socialists. So it's why I think of her as, like, my younger sister. Perfect. Yeah. I mean, like, much younger sister. She's, yeah, she's nine years younger than me. Uh, and so we picked on her the first night at Pesach, and we're like, hey, Maya, you're the youngest. You have to read the four questions. <laughs> <laughs> in doing my, in, in doing some research for this, um, one, one person who was talking about, you know, here are the various steps, the fif the 15 steps, the, you know, why did we drink the wine four times, etc. And at one point he said, oh, by the way, I'm 30 and I am regularly the youngest person in the room. So <laughs> I have read this a dozen times. Yep. I was never the youngest uh, as long as my s younger uh, sister was there. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Even though no matter uh, the age of the kids, all the kids are able to hide the Afi Komen because we always got presents from it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. It's a tr it's a tradition like that. Um. Uh. Huh? Sorry. For some reason, I got a message from Xbox Live, and I'm like, I don't give a fuck about your spring sale. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Please stop doing stop doing a capitalism while I want to do a different type of capitalism by exploiting my labor. Just, just, oh, just, Maya has a tumbler? 
Uh, tumble dry. Uh, no, that's her username. Also, what's uh, your uh, channel on? Tw uh, is it Tale of Two Rabbits? Yes. Uh, well, here. Uh, cause I want to give you a shout out. Let me give you this. All right. Shout out. Tale of two rabbit. Okay. There we go. Oh, wait, I should give you a VIP because you're a content creator. Tale oh, thank you. Of two <clears throat> rabbit. Yeah, I um I try to give um content creators um VIP badges because I got a bunch of them um that I realized weren't being used. I need to set up my VIPs. I still haven't. Yeah. I, was... I um it so um I actually un uh, unlocked a bunch uh because um uh during the height of uh, uh oh god this is this is taking me back to last year fucking uh at the height of the RAR group uh, I was uh doing streams with hundreds of viewers like four days in a row I think it was and so oh, that unlocked grief. a lot of VIP things. That must have been exhausting. I mean, it wasn't as much the amount of pe. It wasn't the amount of people that exhausted me. Like, you know, I don't really feel imposter syndrome most of the time because I've done so much fucking work into getting the knowledge that I do that I'm like, I am an authority when I speak on uh, on most of these subjects. Um, I mean, that and autistic special interest, uh, which fueled my line of study. Um, but it was tiring in the I'm autistic social interactions, heavy subjects type right. of thing. Yeah. And like, Wing, yeah, I, I would, I would suggest having someone because there are questionnaires that you can, they'll go over like baseline introductory stuff. Are you on the spectrum? Answer these questions. I wouldn't necessarily trust like an online source, but most medical professionals are thankfully at this point at least conversant enough in the general topic that they can point you in the direction i'm i would not say that you should rely on a general practitioner for like regular um counseling or anything like that but a gp would at least be able to tell you yeah you fit the profile not specifically really Oh, it's fine, Wing. Um, wait, how long is it? Um, oh yeah, five se uh, five seconds isn't long at all. That's that's why. Oh, I should probably change it to one second, honestly, because um, uh, uh, that's more of uh, reminding people not to use the words and. Like, I'm not necessarily, uh, um, for me, I've done it more that, you know, if, if someone, you know, says the word, I'm not going to be offended by it. It's kind of just like the cumulative, you know, 24 seven bombarding of these ableist terms just being used so regularly that when it comes right. to my streams, you know, I want, I want, you know, even when I'm talking about serious subjects, you know, I want a bit of, you know, this is my, you know, huggy, uh, comfortable space. Because, let's face it, um, I feel, you know, most comfortable when I'm talking about deep intellectual subjects that, you know, I mean, it's comforting to be able to say uh, things like whiteness must be chopped into little tiny pieces. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, and, and not be looked at as if I, as if, you know, I was abnormal somehow. And in that vein i want to uh, I, I don't want to censor i okay i don't want to censor i don't want to censor non-conservative ideas i guess i should right. say i don't want to censor socialist ideas well i mean i don't want to censor any ideas in as much as you know the old know thy enemy type thing um and talking about you know oh why why conservatives have this wrong but I do, you know, want to put certain boundaries and, you know, just simple word usage is one of them because, you know, I, it, it's, it's that, it, 
It's too many microaggressions. Oh. I'm well, gonna... I, can, I can appreciate someone wanting their area to be a safe space for them. I mean, I do follow some streamers and some creators who they make the overt statement. You know, my stream is not a safe space. You will hear slurs, but it's because those, that's the community that I'm trying to reach. And I can fully appreciate that. I can also appreciate that there are people who don't want to deal with that community. Yeah, I deal with it uh, everywhere fucking else. Like, I, I, I didn't get it until I really experienced the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, sheltered. You know, I don't want to, you know, always be in my safe space or whatever, you know, and that I am always in my safe space. You know, I, I know what the real world is like. That's why I feel the need, you know, for communities that, you know, aren't judgmental like that, you know, don't carry these, these biases and, um, you know, are more nurturing. Like for me, this stream, even if, you know, I go very hard, you know, into very serious subjects and, you know, talk a lot about really dark things, especially the dark humor that I think I have. Well, not think I do <laughs> have. Uh, I also want it to be a space where, it, for me, oh, it, it, I guess when I'm, it, I think it's a false distinction between like, you know, oh, cute and cuddly, you know, hug box and, you know, serious discussion on serious issues. I think... I try to do a good balance of, you know, doing both, where I think inclusivity fosters deeper discussion. Agreed. And it's, it, it's a very delicate balance a lot of times trying to, you know, allow disagreement um, uh, and at the same time, knowing when disagreement goes into, you know, like, bad faith bickering and argument. Well, and that for me, tying it into the question of family, that, that for me is establishing I have a direct relationship with this group and this community versus, like, especially the ones that I know who don't filter their chats and don't filter their streams and aren't as concerned with language specifically they also are making the statement i don't consider these people a part of my community yet the yet being implied because you know hopefully some people will change their mind during the course of the conversation frequently they don't which that's fine but they're still acknowledging this is a group who's alienated from me versus this is a group that I want to feel comfortable with. And I know a lot of streamers who their answer to that is, no, 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 this is, this is my community. I don't, I don't need all of these extraneous noises coming at us. I want this to be a place where others can come and feel safe. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's all I try to do. Um, it's, because, again, like, I, I try to make this a... For me, my, I want my community to be one of open discussion. Um, I'm very big. Uh, you know, I know, you know, Karl Popper never officially said this, but I am actually a fan of the idea of, um, uh, you know, uh, tolerance, uh, um, intolerance of the intolerant. You know, it's mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very big on direct action, too. And things like... Uh, you know, that I truly do believe that there are certain things that are off limits. That's why I have rules. But other than that, I encourage discussion and disagreement. I mean, <laughs> uh, my uh, my uh, girlfriend and I, uh, um, twitch.tv slash anarchoanimator, uh, and we're actually going to be meeting in Neat Space for the first time tomorrow. Uh, so I'm hoping we'll do a stream together on Sunday. Huzzah! So, uh, that's, it's, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be fun. I'm, I'm hoping. Uh, and, uh... Is Mazel Tov the correct words for that, word for that? 
I mean, yeah, it is. Okay. Um, Mazel Tov is is generally, you know, congratulations for big, cool, important events. All right, good. I didn't want it to be like a term that's only for weddings or something like that. Oh no, it's it's uh, for instance, you know, um, when I got uh, accepted, uh, I got accepted into Drew's PhD program, which is good because it was the only one I was accepted into. Uh, fucking pandemic, fucking with my plans of applying to my alma mater, NYU. Um, but eh, that, that that's a whole other story. Uh, you know, my parents and my grandparents, etc. You know, they said Mazel Tov. That's it's you know for for big happy occasions. Okay. Like you know, my sister graduating from law school. Me, uh, you know, this year getting my master's. Uh, things like or you know, me and Rachel meeting up uh, IRL for the first time, which is also cool. Anyways. Give her a follow. Very good. Um, she is a lovely lady who uh, helped me realize that I am Polly. Was this something you hadn't thought before, or? Uh, she literally asked me, "Oh, hey, are you Polly?" And I thought about it, and I was like, "Oh, wait, I am." And she was like, "Oh, I am too," and I was like, "Ooh, cool." <laughs> What's funny what is what, what's funny is that in the really uh, really uh, you know um, sexist version of polyamory, uh, you got uh, you got one cishet dude, uh, another cishet lady, and then you got the bisexual woman. And right. the irony is that I did it uh, is that I did it wrong. I'm an NB uh, w uh, with the so-called unicorn, which is. Uh, by uh individual <laughs> i just find it really funny because like i mean it's it's a very interesting relationship in as much as uh one of our first irl dates i want to do is us learning how to do makeup together because she really hasn't done that either and i'm like that is so quintessentially a queer relationship <laughs> it very much is and I, abs it, I absolutely love it. Um, it. I think polyamory is also another way of expanding the idea of family, too. I'm, I am truly curious um, to see how that plays out long term, because there are specifically South American, northern South American tribes whose the way that they understand fertility in general is that a woman can have as many partners as she wants but she gets to decide who the father of her offspring are and in their cosmology the her making that decision is what affects the fertility of the egg so they know that the egg exists and they are aware that sperm is involved but as far as they're concerned the mother making the choice is the one who gets to decide which sperm fertilizes the egg. So I have a question. Um, well, kind of a question, kind of a statement. Um, I asked uh, um, Loss. Uh, no, I think it, uh, it was either I asked either you or Loss Sue about uh, usage of, you know, father and mother in cultures that, you know, don't have a concept of gender. And Loss Sue said, oh, it's, you know, the best way of saying it in English in terms of the, the role, uh, you know, played as, you know, like caregiver, less as, you know, cis heteronormative bullshit. And um, one, I'm wondering uh, if that's the case in this case too, because I get the feeling that it is, but I'm not sure. Well, it sort of goes tribe by tribe. Um, oh, some of some of them okay. they use, well, they will use the term, they will have a feminine form of the word parent, but it will specifically refer to the person who gives birth to the child. And uh, in some cases you can be, I don't want to say not female, but you can be something other than the strictly binary definition of male and female and still be the creature that gives birth to the offspring. 
And so they will still apply that motherhood term to that mm -hmm. person. But it doesn't carry the same expectations that it does in English. So they'll call someone a mother, but really the, the mother's sister is the one who's expected to raise the kids or the mother's brother is the one who's expected to raise the kids. So we, it's a little bit harder to do a direct translation. We try to do more idiomatic translations. I because... mean, English is just a dog shit colonizer language. I should be speaking Yiddish, but that's... It will, and that's where we run into. It's like, there's so many expectations that come with the word mother that we will actually actively avoid using the term if it doesn't directly match up. Because we know that if we say mother, then someone hearing that word in English is going to expect a certain role yeah, that that person doesn't actually have. That's why feminist literature is getting so hard for me, because, like, using terms like men and women is very hard, because, like, I know, you know, trans people existed, but at the same exact time most of those existed outside of the European context. Right. And so, well, and I think that, I think that's what uh, Sue was alluding to as well, is, you know, in, in his language, those sorts of distinctions are not being made in the same way that they're being made in English. So we actually run into some trouble trying to translate the terms directly. Yeah. Also, um, pasta... Judaism is an incredibly sexist culture. Um, it's because of its origins as, uh, you know, Judaism has a lot of great stuff, but if Dave, uh, and I trust David Graeber when he says that uh, the creation of patriarchy and this idea of a gender binary was created by pastoral nomads in the Levant. And what does that sound like? It sounds like Jews. And then you see a lot of the cultural artifacts um, where, I mean, they're, they're literally treating their women as slaves a lot of times. And that's why my Jewish practice, personally, I try to strip as much of that as possible from it. Uh, the one custom I will keep um, is, uh, is wig wearing, because um, in a lot of uh, Orthodox... Um, it's traditional to cover your head or wear wigs as a sign of modesty. And I'm like, um, I'm going to strip the whole compulsive culture aspect of that and be like, nah, I'm a, I'm a wig wearer because <laughs> uh, I like to and because it's cool. And, you know, it also breaks the gender binary because a lot of those really, you know, uh, reactionary Orthodox people be like, no, how dare you desecrate our modesty, you man? Why are you claiming the, the shaitel for yourself? It's not even human hair or kosher. And I'm like, it's because gender is a spook and Jews of all persuasions should be able to indulge in the custom of wig wearing. <laughs> Are they not willing to sort of bridge the gap on the wig versus the skull cap? Is that the issue? That is another issue. Um, it's also the same thing, you know, that uh, that uh, men are supposed to cover their heads with like a kippah or uh, some other thing, you know, as a sign of modesty. Um, and I'm like, uh, well, I ain't no longer wearing no kippah because uh, I ain't, uh, I am no man. And I wear wigs like essentially all the time when I'm not sleeping uh, because it's just constant gender euphoria like if we're just being I mean and it's an autistic special interest so like you know when neuroqueer shit is involved um, uh, and I'm just like well you know what um, if I'm trying to decolonize my mind I should try to get into as many Ashkenazi Jewish customs as I possibly can, you know, because I, I make it a personal goal of, um, there are some actually uh, social and collectivist anarchists who have taken on this idea of self-improvement, um, and I think it's very similar to the Maoist idea of self-crit, and that you should always be trying to improve yourself, and that's, you know, a lot of 
what I took from Star Trek. And I'm like, you know what? If uh, if I can link wig wearing to something that's non-white, then I will do or, or something that <laughs> in uh, in abstract is non-white. And I'm like, oh, and if I can fuck with reactionaries by doing it, then I definitely will do it. I like I like the multi-layer fuck off that is involved in this exactly i'm all about multi-layering my uh my fucking off um <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that i have learned is that um uh it's hard having a beard and wearing uh lace front wigs because you can't glue down the sides because you have sideburns and i'm like that is the one concession i will make to my to 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 maintain my beard is that I won't always be able to glue down uh, the sides of the lace. But other than that, um, other than that, uh, indeed, um, I yeah, actually I actually inverted on its head, um, and I uh, I wear wigs as a proud sign of Judaism and to be special not, you know, as a sign of modesty or whatever. I'm like, no, I'm just going full 360. Uh, I am using it as a, as a, uh, a uh, as a post hoc ra uh, rationalization of tying my Judaism to my queerness and autism. Well, and, and the, the beard issue, that's just pragmatism. I mean, the limitations of the fashion. Exactly. Also, it's also traditional for uh, for Jews to grow beards. I don't know why that is, but it's tradition. And so, um, okay, good. I just realized I'm I am I am uh, I am mixing um, I am mixing uh, two traditions of or uh, okay. I am I am bridging the gap in the orth uh, in the Orthodox Jewish. Uh, uh, a gender binary appearance culture. I'm taking the beard from the men and the wig from the woman and being non-binary and mwah. There is actually a hair tradition among the, I want to say the Navajo. It's either the Navajo or the Hopi. And by the way, getting those two tribes confused irritates the hell out of me because they are very different groups but I believe it's Navajo. Uh, women tended to wear their hair up in sort of like, you know how Leia's hair is done, uh -huh. sort of buns around the ear? They wore something that looked similar to that. It's not quite the same. Very and, cool. Well, men tended to wear their hair down. And so you would occasionally meet someone who was neither, and they would wear one half of their hair in the bun and one half of their hair down. So yes, hair as a statement of gender praxis is uh, pretty consistent with a lot of indigenous practice as well. Awesome. And what's ironic is that I'm actually planning on, uh, I'm growing out my natural hair to at least be down to like the small of my back because um, I like the idea of, um, of, uh, uh, um, of, you know, being able to try uh, it updos and other styles on my own hair before I try to do it on wigs because I can, I don't, you know, necessarily care what happens to my own hair. You know, if I'm, you know, putting it in, in tons of rollers and, you know, like steaming it and backcombing it to high heaven, it'll just fucking grow back. These don't. That was, that was entirely, uh, the singer Pink, that was because they asked her during some interview, you know, aren't you afraid you're going to damage your hair? And her response was, it grows back. You know that, right? <laughs> so. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I mean, there's that, but like, um, uh, it, I'm, I mean, I'm also not going to be like dying in or putting any harsh chemicals in it. The most I'll be doing it is like backcombing it and, uh, and, putting in hairspray and gel. Oh, that, it, I mean... Oh, yeah, I was just... Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, don't get me wrong, like, putting harsh chemicals in it can damage your hair, but I also am like, no, yeah, Pink's right. Uh, it just, it, it grows back. <laughs> and wigs it's do a not. It's fine. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. Gel sensory hell for me. Oh, yeah. See, I actually like the sense of, you know, uh, especially, um, like, 
For me, another great thing, like, you see me, you know, feeling up my wig, it's because it's, it's stim heaven for me. Like, I get these things not only because they look good, because I love stimming with them, too. I have several friends who that's, that's their primary stim is some form of playing with their hair. Exactly. Which there's actually a girl, there was a girl in my graduate class and that was not only her primary form of like keeping herself on attention, but she specifically flipped her hair in that both handed, one hand's holding it into a little bit of a braid and then the other hand is constantly flipping it. So she genuinely looked like she was about five years old. And Aww. a lot of people found it off putting because she, she was doing this hair flip and it looked like she wasn't paying attention. <laughs> yeah um i mean it's very interesting how that happens um actually it's an interesting sensation like when i put uh speaking of sensations uh i really like that um the the way i got this glued down when i lightly pull like this it kind of pulls the skin up a bit um and it it's interesting because it's a very similar sensation to you know when you pull a bit on your regular hair and i'm like oh not only does it look real it feels real perfect and and um you know like again i it i'm i actually have traction alopecia uh right around here uh because for so long i would stim with my hair around there and so that's another great benefit of wig wearing and um because like uh, cause like even, you know, when I have my fidget spinner with me, uh, sometimes I'll still, you know, start playing with other things. I um, mean, if, you know, I don't have a wig on, it might be my hair. Um, right. It, it, I mean, it's interesting how, uh, how, you know, uh, it, all this stuff, you know, I guess it makes sense that it would be an autistic special interest because it's provided so many benefits for me, both, you know, emotional and in terms of stimming it's interesting you know how how weird things can happen like people don't realize also like i think one of the benefits of the modern you know queer and feminist movement you know especially you know uh, lefties is that we're all about you know being able to have any appearance you want because, like, the second wave... Fe uh, by the way, um, I'm actually going to, to share this theory that I can back up in some ways um, with historical evidence. Um, I think indirectly, second wave, specifically liberal rad femmes, you know, the ones who would go on to be turfs and swerfs, uh, stopped the normalization uh, of wig wearing. Um, so I actually um, caught, uh, you know, because, you know, wig is an autistic special interest and I have an access to online university library. I, of course, you know, looked up wig and wigs, you know, and saw what right. primary sources they had. One of them I found was actually a uh, Saturday evening post. And I'm sure this is correct because it was a, you know, it was a essentially it was an article on, you know, the booming wig industry. And so they were saying, you know, oh, you know, uh, uh, w wig sales of, you know, like quadrupled in da -da -da how many years and like. I mean, chances are it's probably true because, you know, like accurate statistics make great advertising. Um, right. And so, and also knowing things like manufacturing consent, I very well could see, you know, if the rad femmes being like, no, you must have long, free flowing hair and da da da, you know, and them like policing appearance when, um, not only were synthetic uh, wig fibers that uh, making wigs drastically cheaper, um, but you know a lot of people, especially in the early '60s, um, you know when wigs were just starting to get really big, um, uh, a lot of women didn't have hours and hours and hours to spend in the friggin' salon. You know they weren't uh, bourgeois motherfuckers; they had to work. But they also, you know, wa uh, whether, you know, they felt it needed to be for a job or because they just simply, you know, liked looking good in on current fashion, because um, it's almost as if uh, y you can like, 
you know, uh, um, certain things while uh, a whole different. Um, it's this idea of you know uh, you can literally just drop the wig off, you know, have the stylist do it once, and then you know like have it for a week, and right. you know be working while you do that. And so, you know, this whole, you know, oh, you need to be natural, no make. They literally burn, the rad femmes literally burn bras, makeup, and wigs. When I know for a fact that there are some people with large enough breasts that they feel uncomfortable without bras. That was, uh, the rad femmes that I knew in the 80s and 90s, they tended to actually cut their hair really short. There were a few of them who did the free-flowing hair thing but they were actually really aggressively anti-androgyny because as far as they were concerned, that was... The way they justified that was by saying that you were buying into the myth that uh, the, the sexes were equal and that you could be whatever you wanted to be now, even though women are still getting paid less and there's you know still voting issues at present and while I understand that argument, that excludes half of the gay population at the time, because androgyny was really big in the club scene, especially, but just in the gay community in general. And so you're, you're just sort of wiping out all of the drag queens, you're wiping out all of the, you know, the guys who like to wear lipstick, this whole cadre of people. Yeah, and there's the whole subculture of, you know, I love the idea of costume jewelry specifically because it looks, you know, like bourgeois as fuck, but it's cheap. Like, yeah, it's that's the whole... And, and also, you know, it, it, the, the fucking liberal rad femmes, you look at the first generation of socialist feminists, there's a reason why I nicknamed my, you know, uh, super high pompadour French twist wig Rosa. It's because Rosa Luxemburg <laughs> wore her hair like that and, you know, had super fly dresses because that shit was a lot cheaper. And, you know, these were powerful women, you know, who were conscious of the fact that, you know, capitalism and sexism were intertwined and da 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 da. And yet they loved looking good. Like these yeah. aren't two mutually exclusive things. Yeah, I, I always found that argument fairly alienating that. You know, in in order to acknowledge that women are having a bad time, we therefore have to buy into all of this other gendered nonsense. And I'm like, no, you you can you can just fight for equal pay. Like, you you can fight for everybody getting paid the same amount of money for the same amount of work, and not mix that in with now let's have a long protracted conversation about how drag queens are ruining women. Like, wh wh what? <laughs> These two things are not related, but... Uh -huh. Exactly. Like, again, and I think that's one of the best things uh, the queer uh, liberation movement has done is to show that, it. I mean, if anything, it, for me, also wig wearing, especially in, you know, really complicated and beautiful updos, uh, or just you know, I guess in any style, a re the main reason why, you know, I literally tortured myself and suppressed that special interest of mine for over a decade is because of internalized queer phobia. Like, like the idea of, you know, <laughs> I have no idea what, and, and it's very much this idea of self-acceptance and, you know, I see, it, 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 there's also, you know, this idea of, you know, for me wearing wigs as, you know, almost like a disguise, but in a good way. Like, you know, it's not a disguise as in deception. It's a disguise as in, you know, being able to change up my appearance, you know, seeing a different side of myself. Right. Um, and... I, I mean, I think it, it, uh, it, it really is, uh, uh, it, anyways, getting back to the point, um, if the rad femme, uh, bullshit hadn't taken place and, uh, and, it, and if, you know, Madison Avenue hadn't been like, hey, we can make a profit from all this hippy dippy bullshit, um, <laughs> that's, that's at least five years out of date in terms of Haight-Ashbury being a haven for anarchists. 
Um, there's actually a source for this. Uh, and then they were like, yes, uh, uh, um, uh, it, Femini liberal feminism, good. Women have free, uh, free uh, uh, flowing hair. And then, you know, wigs became no longer a thing and, uh, or no longer as much of a thing, uh, despite the fact that in the mid to late 60s, they were incredibly popular for, I mean, all the reasons that I listed. Uh, convenience, uh, price, having to fucking work, but still wanting to look good. Um, and also, uh, unfortunately for black women still today, the racism in, all oh, your hair isn't straight and neat and nice, uh, Honestly, in racism. They, they call it ethnic hair. Because my husband is a cosmetologist, and when they are training cosmetologists, they will refer to it. There is long, straight, blonde hair, and then there's ethnic hair. And literally, it means the rest of the planet, which is baffling to me, but... Exactly. Like, again, that's why... Uh, I mean, it started as a meme, but anarcho-wigism is essentially everyone should be able to wear as many wigs as they want in any style they want and not be compelled to do it. Yeah. Like, I well, have I'm taken the Jewish... Uh, uh, it, I really do like the idea that, you know, uh, a lot of Orthodox and uh, uh, Jews, you know, the men, the, the men grow beards and the women wear wigs. And I'm like, well, I'm non-binary because I'm doing both. <laughs> well, and both Wing and Fish are making a similar point. The idea of a man having long hair. Now, I, I, I speak from personal experience here. You have nothing but my envy. Uh, my hair has, even when it was long, when I was much younger, it was, it has always been so ridiculously angel fine. That, oh, mine's like, thick as fuck. See, my friend tried to put my hair in a French braid one time and she had to make the braid so tight Aww. that it actually pulled my eyelids back. Oh fuck, it, that's horrible. It held in place for a good five minutes. Like she finished completely, she put a little band around the bottom and it started to work itself out uh, almost immediately because I can so give you a link to a French braid wig I found for around $35 on AliExpress. Oh, no, it's I'm not I'm not envious. I was just oh. trying like at the time. <laughs> I would be. <laughs> well, and she was saying, you know, I you know, you a French braid will hold for anybody. And I'm like, "Okay, sure, go ahead. Give it a shot." But okay. so it was just mostly it was me saying, no, my hair doesn't hold these shapes, which I was fine with. It didn't bother me. But I am envious you, of yeah, especially yeah. guys who can grow the long, slightly curly hair. That's literally just, me. I, <laughs> that's literally. Yeah, that's, well, except the, the yeah. guy part. But no, my hair is like, I think in terms of texture, it's, it's like 2A, I believe. In, in terms yeah. of, it, you know, like, there there's a 2A, 2B, 2C, then uh, in, in terms of, you know, like, the curl or the kink it has. Yeah, for me, that's a magical power. And, uh, oh, it's um, it, it's actually very prevalent in, uh, in Ashkenazi Jews. Um, and redheads. Redheads tend to have that little bit of curl. I did not know that. Um, I also, I mean, <laughs> personally, I find that type of hair attractive. Like, my partner has thick-ass black hair, which, when we met, he was wearing in a seven-inch tall mohawk. Face. And, yeah. And I'm like, okay, what's your number? You know, it was, was instant. <laughs> it's beautiful. I mean, for me, in terms of my gender spectrum presentation, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, I actually love, uh, uh, it, I love, uh, it, I've always loved me in suits, but now I want to wear them more, uh, simply because, you know, I care more about uh, my appearance and grooming because it's something fun for me. Oh yeah, if you can play around with it, by all means. I, yeah, I need to get more dress. I uh, need to get especially some more skirts that I'll 
use. Um, and oh, then, of course, look. you know, Rachel and I hopefully are going to be uh, playing with makeup together because that is the best queer date ever. I, I completely agree. I look terrible in skirts. I, I have done Ren Fairs for years. Kilts are a thing. So, you know, it's not like anybody ever questioned my masculinity or an, I could have walked in wearing a full length ball gown and they wouldn't have cared because I was a nice. fencer at the time. Oh yeah. Nice. Uh, they, they probably would have thought I was messing with them, but I look atrocious in skirts because I have my mother's shoulders, but I have my father's hips. And that's actually an inversion of what most people expect because my mother's family's German, father's family tall and native. <laughs> so I have lanky ass legs and hips and these broad ass shoulders. I am a triangle. Oh, <laughs> does... I uh, I have an NB dad bod. So like I don't. I have a bit of an indent, but like my my weight, it, it's more or less. I'm more or less a T. I think maybe a bit of a. Uh, an NB dad bod, so like there's a bit of that. I've been wondering whether or not I should try corsets. Just it, it, it's not like at this point, I've accepted the fact that you know I'm probably gonna be slightly overweight, uh, but not like dangerously so. So I want it right. more in terms of appearance than you know, like oh, I'm fat or whatever. I'm like, I mean, could I afford to lose a two, few pounds? Yeah, but I don't, I know I'm not going to be able to get myself to exercise enough to do that. So <laughs> like, I, and you know, I've come to accept the fact that, you know, I mean, actually a lot of people kind of are attracted to this physique. So. Oh yeah, run with it. The, I, the, I have said for years, you don't have to be your type. You have to be someone else's type. Exactly. That's why I think this whole, oh, you know, she's way out of your league, bro. And I'm thinking to myself, um, I'm dating an incredibly attractive person who, when, you know, a few, uh, few, you know, like a decade ago, I would have thought, oh, I could never date her. And I'm like, I mean, now I can, because, because <laughs> I know that's horseshit. Like, like that whole idea of, uh, it, as, um, as I have said, I am a fad. I am both, uh, I am both a, uh, a, uh, a, I am both, I am an NB Chad. I'm a fad, but, uh, I am also a virgin. I've overcome the virgin Chad dichotomy, uh, <laughs> and become a fad. <laughs> well, and for me, this is one of the reasons that I was talking about being, being able to live in small communities, but having connections outside of that, because I think it also broadens the possibility of meeting someone who clicks with you and, and being able to form that kind of community because, you know, you get into a really small community and they have really insular standards of beauty as well. And I'm particularly irritated with the commercialization of a very particular type of beauty. You know, you have to have this measure of waist. You have to have this measure of hips, etc. Exactly. So, like to me, that that aspect of building community is also something that I've enjoyed watching. That beauty standards have started to swing back the other direction. I know a lot of people. You know, including me. You know, I love you know fifties and sixties. You know, high culture, high fashion. You know. Uh, 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 bold fashion, huge beehives, etc., etc. And of course, it was um, uh, at least judging by uh, judging by. Um, it, I mean, even the even you know the quote unquote male hairstyles. You know, like they took a lot of time with their appearance too. Um, oh yeah. Oh and yeah. I it. I mean, I just love that whole uh, the, that whole you know. It, I mean, this hairdo is. The inspiration, like the French twist, was was incredibly common, especially back then, because it's awesome and it's relatively easy to do. Um, and uh, you know, this kind of like front flippy area, um, the inspiration was uh, was actually a uh, hairstyle I saw in Mad Men from 1960. So like, this nice. is, I mean, and. The first uh, full-length dress I ever bought, it doesn't fit me great, but I got off of Etsy and it's in the 1960s style. So I love that whole look. Um, I mean, it, it, 
<laughs> to use a hashtag I've seen on the Instagram accounts I follow, uh, um, vintage look, not vintage values. And I'm like, I mean, hell yeah. Um, even I though really there are like some, them. there are some vintage values I like, um, like the thousands of years of Jewish communal sense and right. But but it, but I'm I'm being pedantic because <laughs> I like being pedantic. I actually I like that anthem. Yeah, vintage style, not vintage values. Oh, completely agreed. Um, like I. It, it's kind of like you know interesting how you uh, how we came to that and I'm like um it it also kind of really shows you know th this I uh, this idea the more and more I've come to see you know I enjoy cultivating a certain appearance you know dressing well you know uh, uh, styling up my wig well like I like making my wigs look as real as possible. Not because I'm worried, you know, I tell people I'm wearing a wig all the time. It's because I like the way it looks. And, and you know, you have all these conservative people saying, Oh, you know, uh, you're just a she-male or whatever. And even more, Oh, you know, women only dress the way they do because they want to appeal to a man and have, uh, and have a male. And I'm like, well, actually, no, um... I take pleasure in looking good and having a certain aesthetic because it makes me feel good. Um, and that would happen regardless of, you know, whatever bullshit, you know, idea of beauty standards we have in the world. Because I can tell you, the beauty standards, which are uh, inherently a gender binary, um, I am not fitting that. So uh, I can tell you, uh, yeah, I just do it because I like how I look. Right. And I like how it makes me feel. Oh shit! I you're right, fi uh, fish. I have uh, resolved the contradiction of gender. Uh, do whatever the fuck you want, uh, appearance-wise. Um, oh yeah, Lynn, I completely agree. I wear skirts and dresses because comfy. Yeah. Uh, if the standard is in order to make yourself feel better, I, where is the problem? Exactly. Honestly, I, I, it, I mean, if we're being completely honest, you know, in, in a post-scarcity, uh, you know, in a post-revolution world, uh, where, you know, luxury automated communism hasn't been created yet, would I probably have to give up on my dream of having a literal closet filled with wigs? Yeah, of course I would. Um, but I could have, you know, two or three, maybe. There you go. But At least I, something mildly satisfying. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Um, the way I rationalize literally everything I do is there is no ethical consumption under capitalism. They're going to be manufacturing every wig that I buy anyway. Like, the only difference between me buying it and someone else is someone else is going to buy it. Yeah, it's mainly timing, yeah. Exactly. Like... Like, yeah, you know, am I benefiting from exploited labor? Yeah, uh, I am... I don't think there's anything here that in... Literally, I'm staring at paint that in one way or another, you know, manufacturing, you know, applying the paint, da, 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 was a result of exploited labor. Like, we can't... Uh, the only way to do that is to is to live you know, completely on your own, uh, you, you know, liter make literally everything, you know, uh, none of this, you know, oh, I go into town once a year to re no, 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 that's not off the grid. Off the grid is you literally, if you want internet, you literally have to fucking make it and lay the cables, or no, and make the cables and then lay the cables. That is the only way. If literally every, uh, every, piece of technology and any material you make is made only by you via everything else then you are still benefiting some way in some way from someone's exploitation that's what's so fucked up about this world that's why 
I am able to live with myself using Amazon's two-day free shipping because it saves so much time and money. <laughs> well, and we can still support a union. Oh, fuck yeah. I was, I was just about to say... Uh, uh, well, I was also about to say, you know, I'd be fine with, you know, guaranteed three-day shipping if it meant Amazon workers could have better conditions. You know, I'm, I'm fine with, you know, not having it, it, as long as it's, you know, guaranteed, hell, even if it was a guaranteed week, instead of, you know, the 7 to 14 business days that most other places have, I would be fine with that if it meant that there was less exploitation. Right. But, like, it, it, it's very much in this whole liberal mindset of, oh, you use Amazon? Cancelled. And I'm like, okay, that sucks. What about people who, you know, especially if you're, uh, uh, there are a lot of reasons why, you know, oh, you're poor, 70, uh, 75 to to $100 a year if you get a shit ton of stuff from Amazon, especially, you know, if you're disabled and, you know, or for one reason or another live in a food desert or something, uh, you have to order shit from Amazon for your food. Um, we shouldn't be, be faulting people for doing things for economic advantage, and we shouldn't be faulting people for wanting a, uh, a closet's room of wigs while capitalism is still a thing. Um, also, I, I want a walk-in closet for wigs also, because when COVID's not a thing, I'm going to be like, yo, comrades near me, y'all want to borrow a wig? I have a lot. Feel free to do that, because COVID's no longer a thing. And I really like that idea, especially because, you know, for us queer comrades, especially, you know, things like playing with appearance is a lot of fun and important to us. And COVID ruined yeah. that for me. I think I think sometimes in the rhetoric, we get lost on the idea that we should also be be able to feel comfortable in ourselves. You know, it, there's a lot of talk of revolution, I think, excludes where we are right now and whether or not we feel like we are in a place that brings us satisfaction and joy and brings us a sense of community rather than just a sense of drive exactly like and that is the thing uh all of the most successful revolutionary movements have created what gramsci called a, uh, a counter hegemony that is their own culture and there's a reason why, you know, uh, revolutionary songs are a thing. You know, why why there's all this culture. Because you need that culture outside of, you know, capitalist realist bullshit. And one of, by the way, um, uh, another way of social control was, especially at the height of the People's Republic of China, if you didn't, you know, have that classic Mao suit and, you know, a little red book in your pocket and, you know, da-da-da-da-da-da, um, Mao himself was actually very, uh, was actually very, uh, fingers crossed that this was true, um, but according to a secondary source that I trust, Mao was actually appalled by the amount of, like, performative loyalty to, you know, what eventually developed as a cult around him. Like, Mao obviously wasn't perfect, you know? Uh, he underestimated the bureaucratization that would happen, and of course, after he died, the system he created, uh, fell apart because he wasn't there to keep, you know, all the, all the different power structures in check. Um, and even then it wasn't, but like the it, appearance is very important. Like people do, it, you know, people are always like, oh, you know, uh, it, it, you're, you have alopecia. Why are you complaining that you're bald? Bald is da, da, da. And I'm like, um, because we live in a fucked up society and, you know, uh, also sometimes people, you know, even if they're totally fine with being bald, sometimes just like having hair also. Um, cause, you know, it's fun to switch things around and, uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't police people's appearance? Agreed. With the exception of things like blackface, that's, but that's a whole different thing. That, I think, is more an issue of, I mean, that's, 
Th that to me, you would have a hard time making the case that that's simply a fashion preference. You know, I'd, I feel more comfortable if I paint myself in ash. Uh, no, I don't buy that. It's, Actually, yeah, that is true. <laughs> Yeah, there's 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 like several layers worth of conversation that I that I would have to have with someone before I was willing to accept that argument just raw. I love the idea of um of uh, of of um of uh, in in some future video game revolution, my avatar uh, um killing the uh, killing Beth Jesus just in looking like you know some CEO's wife in the 1960s with the hugest beehive hair and just being <laughs> like, appearances can be deceiving, Beth Jesus. Sort of a comic book villain situation. Yeah, though. like, I love the contra... Uh, and, and again, the thing is, is that the hardest core revolutionaries like Rosa Luxemburg, Emma Goldman, who is called the most dangerous woman in America, um, and for good reason, she looked... I mean, her, her hairstyle was fucking on point. She always had amazing dresses and clothes. And she was getting fucking arrested regularly. Like, these things aren't mutually exclusive. Well, with that particular happy mental image, I actually need to bow out. Um, All right. I have another appointment that I need to attend to. Totally legit. Um, in that case, uh, why don't you uh, give us your concluding thoughts and um, show for yourself. Uh, also, it gives me time to find someone to raid. Oh, okay. Well, I'm absolutely grateful for providing me this opportunity to experience a Shabbat. Um, I'm glad that your chat found at least a few things that resonated. Um, ultimately, if you're looking for other thoughts on indigenous praxis, then I stream on Sundays right now. I'm hoping to also start streaming on Wednesdays. But you can find me at Tale of Two Rabbit on Twitch. And I also have a YouTube channel if you're interested in some indigenous history and uh, even some discussion of things like critical race theory and indigenous relationships to socialism and communism, thoughts along those lines. But mostly what I do on Twitch is play video games and answer questions from the stream, from the chat, and uh, lots of sarcasm, hopefully. And uh, <laughs> other than that, I uh, appear on other people's streams. Very cool. Um, so we, uh, so I will be back Sunday, hopefully with Rachel, a.k.a. a narco animator. Um, when I